secret homes and hideaways meet survival of the fittest, animal builders that claw their way to the top and sink their teeth into their work, all to make a little place they can call home. Now, nature's engineers on Modern Marvels. Mighty dams that hold back the wildest of rivers, intricate tunnels that connect entire communities, and towering skyscrapers buzzing with life. This is construction animal style, where every day the world is remade by creatures seemingly designed to alter their habitat. We call them nature's engineers. The way most animals that build things do it is by running through a series of routines. What they do is the same thing over and over and over again until they reach some criterion, which they recognize innately. Then they switch to the next routine and they run through it over and over again. Dam building is one of humanity's earliest triumphs. Our ancestors' ability to create reservoirs that held precious water was paramount for early agriculture. Later, humans began to understand the power generating potential in holding back water and slowly releasing it to drive water wheels. Over millennia, the art and science of dam building has been perfected with such massive water stopping and power generating structures as the Hoover Dam. But long before the first human industry tried to block even a tiny stream, an animal craftsman was fashioning dams of great size and sophistication. One of my favorite animals is a beaver. With the exception of corals, building huge coral reefs, they create the largest structures that are made by animals, uh, sometimes a quarter mile across, sufficiently well made that you can ride a horse across the dam, for example. Like most of nature's engineers, the beaver's purpose is to construct a secure home to raise its young and stay safe from predators. For a pair of mating beavers, this means building a sturdy home called a lodge. But the animals are very particular when it comes to location. For added protection, they prefer their home be surrounded by water. For many, the first step in building a house is building a lake. And that involves creating one of nature's most sizable engineering feats the beaver dam. But even the largest structures must begin with the felling of a single tree. Down here near the water, we have a prime example of beaver activity. You see down on the base, the beaver's gotten in here, chiseled away with those chisel-type teeth, gotten into the meat of the tree or the cambium layer. And if a beaver takes down this willow, its likely uses would be for dam building or for forage. And if the beaver is going to forage off the tree, uh, it would likely use uh, some of the, the limbs up top uh, that are more easily digestible, the bark's thinner. If the beaver uses it for dam building, once it trees down, it's probably going to strip off some of the, uh, the branches. For humans, even with the proper tools, felling a tree is hard work. But beavers are well adapted for this task, and the only tools they need are right in their own skulls. Here's the beaver's skull, and you can see that the front two teeth are very sharp. There's a layer of hard enamel on the outside and soft dentine, and they work together, and when they touch, they sharpen each other. This tooth extends almost this far into the lower jaw, likewise in the upper jaw. They have extremely powerful muscles that operate those jaws those masseter muscles that attach here to bite through that wood are very, very strong. The rest of the beaver's body is equally well designed for aquatic construction. Their small, agile front feet let them weave branches and scoop mud, two very important steps in dam building. In contrast to the popularly held cartoon image, beavers do not use their broad, flat tails to shovel and pack mud. Instead, they use them as rudders when swimming. And if the animal is startled, they slap their tails against the water to sound an alarm. The beaver's webbed rear feet also allow them to move effortlessly through the water. Which is important, because if you're going to build a dam, you have to get your feet wet. The beavers will start chewing off small twigs and branches off of trees and plugging them into areas where they can get a foothold in the bottom of the stream so that as they pack mud and more sticks and bigger sticks behind them, the water starts to build up. 
where rising water behind an unfinished dam would spell disaster to human engineers, beavers seem to recognize and exploit the construction advantages. Beaver are built to deal with water. And when they are building their dam, they take use of the fact that wood floats. They harvest stuff around the dam. If they have to, they will build channels way out, a long ways out, deep channels, 18 inches deep, that will fill with water. They'll drop the trees, they'll pull them in. It's like a barge dragging the stuff using the water. So a lot of the material comes from upstream. The final step for most beavers is the packing of stones and mud between the loose wood. The exterior coating helps to solidify the structure and keeps water from seeping through small cracks and fissures. But the beaver's job is never really finished. The animal will continue to maintain the structure from season to season. Beaver don't have any need to keep their dams as absolute zero flow devices. Uh, although during much of the year they'll busily repair any damage, find any leaks, and, uh, and patch them. In other parts of the year, uh, when there's a lot of uh, stream flow, they may actually lower the dam to provide a spillway to take strain off of the dam. And during the winter, uh, they'll wait until the ice is formed, and then they'll go and actually cut a hole just below the ice through the dam and lower the water level slightly so that they have an airspace to breathe in uh, between the water and the ice. But for all its fame, the beaver dam is only a means to an end. The beaver dam is the most obvious structure in the beaver's habitat, but the pond behind the beaver dam is really where the beaver lives and where it thrives. The lodge is built there. That provides the animal protection from predators and from the elements. These lodges are really fascinating. When I was growing up, I thought that when a beaver made a lodge, it actually built a hole in there as it was building up and when it completed the structure it would have the hole in there but they don't they just pack stuff logs and branches and mud and then when they're done they go from outside underneath with their claws and with their teeth and they dig away at the packed structure that they've made and hollow out their lodge the inside of the lodge isn't all that big you know, this one is probably 12 feet across and five or so feet tall, but the inside is only a few feet across and a few feet tall. Most beaver lodges are two-story affairs. The first story, or chamber, is closest to the entrance and is used by the animal to dry off upon returning home. The second is where the animals spend most of their time huddled together for warmth. The beavers take great care when constructing their homes because they often plan on staying a long time. The beaver will add to the lodge every year. As you can see, it was mainly a, a mud and small twig lodge, and it's dragged up some pretty big pieces. Later on, if it goes out further or if the pond becomes deeper and it has access to even larger trees, it will tote some of those across. On some of the lakes around here that have beaver lodges, some of the logs that are brought up are six or so inches in diameter. In the end, here is where the beaver's months of hard work pays off. Protected from the elements and predators, the pair welcomes a new generation of baby builders to the lodge. Beavers are incredible engineers. They may not really understand what they're building, but the results of what they create, the huge lodge, the large dams, have a profound effect on the ecosystem. In this situation, they built a dam on the outlet of a lake and they raised the water level of this lake almost three feet. A 40 or 50 acre lake, and that's 350 acre feet of water, which is an amazing amount of water to be backed up behind a pile of sticks and mud and rock. The dam's inelegance is the secret to its strength. But not all animals share the same crude design philosophy. Beavers may be some of the best known builders on the planet, but their wooden creations look simple compared to the complex structures built by some of nature's most exacting engineers. With six sides intersecting at 60 degree angles, the hexagon is one of nature's strongest and most efficient shapes. 
The hexagon is the most efficient structure uh, that can be built. You have the maximum volume in the cell with the minimum structure on the outside, and each one fits perfectly to the next. In the 1940s, the visionary Buckminster Fuller recognized the hexagon's potential in construction. The flower of his work was the space-age structure known as a geodesic dome, which offered stability and a lot of interior space. Hexagon-shaped materials are ideal whenever a structure must be light and strong. Today, they can be found just under the skin of jet fighters, and even on the space shuttle. But long before the hexagon was protecting astronauts and orbiting high above the Earth, it could be found in a field and usually held something sweet. Honeybees build combs that have hexagonal cells in them. This turns out to be one of the structurally strongest forms that they could do. And it probably has more to do with actually how the cells fit together than, than intentionally making them to be strong. But it works out that they can make very large structures that are very light in weight. Honeybees live throughout the world in all but the very coldest climates. A buzzing, roiling hive is an animal metropolis held together by careful engineering, communal living, and some very sticky material. Scientists who study these animals take great care not to get on their subject's bad side. I'm attempting to light a smoker, because if you puff smoke into the colony, you don't get met with as much resistance. Uh, we have to use a hive tool to break in because the honeybees collect plant resins, pine pitch, and they use that to seal every single crack. So every comb is stuck in, every box is stuck to the other box, the cover is stuck on, so we have to break in. Each hive is ruled by a queen, and when new queens are born, only one can stay. The honeycomb beehive takes shape when one of the queens, like this one, marked by the beekeeper with a yellow dot, and a portion of the worker bees leave a functioning hive to build a new home. The swarming insects look for knots in trees, clefts in rocks, or abandoned burrows in the ground. But on occasion, confused bees have been known to start building on top of cars. For many of these winged engineers, the best man-made structures are those built specifically for them. They already know that I'm here, and the reason that I can tell you that is they can feel vibrations, and so they are actually aware that something has come up, but these bees are pretty docile, so it's not that much of a problem. We put some smoke in the entrance. We can look around. If there's another place out here where there's a hole and they're using that as an entrance, we'd have to smoke that too because that's where the guard bees are, but I don't see any. A mature functioning hive is a wonder of cooperation and organization. Over the course of their lives, each bee will perform nearly every task in the hive, including foraging, guard duty, and even babysitting. As young workers, the bees spend time looking after the larvae developing in the brood comb. But the most important stage in a bee's life, for construction, is when they begin to produce their own unique and pliant building material, wax. The substance is formed by glands inside the bee's body. Once secreted, the wax collects in thin sheets between the plates of the insect's abdomen. Those glands usually get activated when the bee is fully engorged with nectar. This occurs in two principal circumstances. One is if the colony is bringing in lots of nectar from the outside, having a hard time finding a place to store it. Another circumstance is when a colony swarms, the individuals in the swarm, before they leave the hive, fill up their crops with honey. The bees chew the newly manufactured wax to make it malleable and seem to place it entirely by feel. How do the bees build these perfect hexagons? Um, we don't know all of the answer yet, but one of the things we do know is that the size of them and presumably the angles between them are sensed by the bee essentially with her forelegs. So if the legs of a bee are damaged, she will build an exact comb relative to a bee with intact legs. For scientists, other questions arise, such as how do all the bees know in which direction to build? Bees appear to use magnetic fields to help them line up those combs parallel to each other, so that when a colony moves into a new cavity, the orientation of the combs that they tend to build has been shown to be correlated with the orientation of the combs in their previous hive, in the previous nest. And if an experimenter 
experimentally removes the Earth's magnetic field by using electromagnetic coils, that consistency is lost. In the end, all the cells will be built almost exactly the same, with between 25 and 30 cells per square inch. The bees' construction is so uniform that beekeepers are able to install man-made foundation, special wax sheets with molded hexagons, into their box hives. The bees build directly onto the foundation, and the result is honeycomb in a box. The length of the cells vary depending on species and intended use. Honeycomb cells can be some of the longest, while broodcomb cells built to house the queen's eggs are shorter, usually just big enough to house the growing larvae. The cells are adjusted seasonally depending on the kind of individuals they want to raise. Queens require a larger cell, so when they want to turn a worker larva into a queen, they actually lengthen the cell by half again probably and give it much more food and special nutrients. The queen bee seems to inspect each cell in the brood comb before depositing one of the over half a million eggs she will lay during her lifetime. If any little heads come up, you use a little bit more smoke. Okay, in this particular comb, we have mostly capped brood, which is the suede-looking material that's a little reddish in color. And then out here by my right thumb, this is honey. You can see that the cappings are a little bit shinier. There's a very small amount of pollen right along here and also along here. So this is the classic honey over the top, pollen along the edges, brood in the middle comb, like you would see a picture of in a textbook somewhere. But survival of the species demands that bees, even in the perfect home, must eventually leave. From old hives come new swarms, which fly off to make a new home and start the entire geometric construction process again. But bees aren't the only insect city builders to make use of the hexagon. Wasps have a similar construction style to house their offspring. Starting with a strong branch, the wasps build a bell-shaped comb with each cell large enough to fit a wasp larva. Paper wasps make their colonies and they actually do have hexagonal cells in those just like the honeybees do. But these insects don't produce wax and so they construct their colonies out of plant fibers that they collect by scraping fibers off leaves. They mix that with saliva and then they build the paper using that material. So it's a different kind of construction but sort of similar uh, engineering principles. Just as with the honeybee's creation, the hexagonal shape allows all the cells to fit together in a modular fashion. Once finished with a group of cells, many wasps construct additional combs and stack them like floors in a hotel. That material is supplied in a series of layers with air spaces between it. Provides good insulation to help keep the colonies warm. Wasp colonies are sometimes built out in the open as sort of football-shaped nests that you might see hanging in trees. Other times they're built inside of cavities in the ground. But no matter where wasps build, their survival depends on the strength of their homes. Fortunately, their nests are unexpectedly tough. Actually, the paper they make is pretty waterproof. It's something in the saliva that they mix with the plant fibers makes it quite strong, very lightweight. But typically, the nest will only be used for one season. The wasps, like all animals, are practical engineers. Overbuilding a structure means extra work. And in the animal world, that equates to extra food, a luxury that's not always available. But on rare occasions, when all the animal's needs are met, the nests can take on a life of their own. The largest wasp nest I've ever seen was one that was excavated in Hawaii from the western yellow jacket, which is a pest in Hawaii. This nest had become perennial, and it was six feet by three feet, and it was in the ground. And it consisted of probably hundreds of thousands of cells and workers. It was just enormous. <laughs> I've never seen anything bigger. <laughs> but winged insects aren't the only airborne animal engineers. Birds have been building nests for millions of years. They too are hardwired to build. That doesn't mean there's no room for improvement. There's no place like home. Humans have been subscribing to that philosophy since we began dwelling in caves. 
Today, houses are some of the most prolific structures on the face of the planet. But housing tracts filled with identical structures and one-of-a-kind mansions are simply the latest examples in a long line of structural evolution. An evolution that started thousands of years ago, when people first gathered sticks, straw, rocks, and mud to build their homes. Something birds figured out how to do millions of years earlier. Why do birds build nests? Birds build nests to protect their young, uh, to shield them from adverse weather, to protect them from predators, to make sure that the young have all of the warmth that they need to develop correctly. Since all birds lay eggs, they don't give birth to live young. They need to have protection for the eggs. All birds may lay eggs, but the nests they build vary greatly. Ultimately, time and evolution have had the greatest effect on the structures birds build. The earlier birds, the ones that you see records of being in the fossil record from way back, those birds tend to build pretty simple nests constructed, say, in the sand. The birds that have come on the scene more recently, those birds are the ones that build more complex nests and actually weave nests. North American bald eagles build their homes from materials found on the forest floor. High in the treetops, eagles intertwine fallen branches to form nests up to four feet wide. But no matter what their size, most stick-built nests share a similar characteristic. They're cozy inside. This is the nest of a house wren, which is common across North America. And this is built generally inside some other structure. You can see the way the bird has constructed this nest. It started out with larger uh, fibers and branches in the bottom part of the nest that allows the nest to withstand elements. As you get closer and closer to the cup, they start using more fine fibers. Here you can see small grasses, and then the actual cup itself, where the eggs are, is lined with feathers. But not all birds are woodworkers. Many strive for something a little more concrete and make mud their construction material of choice. Swallows build their nests high on the walls of buildings or under bridges and freeway overpasses. Inside, the birds lay straw and feathers for insulation and to provide a soft floor for their eggs and young. Other birds don't need the strength of solid mud construction. Instead, they thrive by building small and inconspicuous nests. This is one of my favorite nests. This is the nest of a Anna's hummingbird, which is found along the Pacific coast of North America. And the Anna's hummingbird constructs its nest essentially using spider webs, and then it attaches lichens and other small grass and so forth around the edge of the nest, and then lines the nest with cottony material that it gets from plants. The lichen actually helps to conceal the nest on the branch, uh, which is a camouflage that the bird uh, relies on to keep uh, other birds from finding its nest to predate its young. If you've ever tried to find hummingbird nests in the tree, it is extremely difficult. Masters of disguise, structural engineers, homemakers. For humans, it's often easy to see creativity and intelligence in the bird world. It doesn't really exist. When it comes to birds, it's easy to believe that what we see involves more intelligence. And what they build looks uh, superficially uh, much more intelligent and much more complex. But in fact, it really isn't. The idea that they have some concept of what the nest is going to look like is uh, a romantic fiction. It's been shown in lots of species of bird. My favorite, though, are just birds that build simple cup nests. If you cut a hole in the bottom, slightly larger than an egg, the birds will not repair it. Instead, they will just mindlessly lay their eggs one a day into this nest. The eggs will roll out the bottom, and the birds will just keep right on laying them. Still, the birds don't rely entirely on hardwired routines when constructing nests. Their techniques prove that their brains are designed to learn. Birds definitely improve in their nest building capabilities from season to season. When they first start out, most bird species are not great at building nests. Uh, so as they practice, though, from season to season, they learn how to hold nest material. They learn how to pick particular plant materials that are better um, and will make a nest last longer. So usually by the second or third year of building a nest, the nests are made very, very well. I think we're fascinated with animals and the things they build uh, mainly uh, because uh, the, the complexity uh, and the, yet the relative ease with which the animals uh, create these structures. You think about trying to build a nest yourself, uh, you can realize that uh, we would be very clumsy. 
I used to have my animal behavior classes、uh, sit around tables and try to make a robin's nest or an oriole nest. Very quickly, people、uh, threw in the towel. And an oriole nest seems rudimentary when compared to this, the ornithological equivalent of the moonshot. It's built by a type of African weaver called a cassin's malimbe. This is the most intricate nest. This is one of the finest、uh, engineer work in the bird world. This is not just a bunch of stick put in together. This long tunnel in here actually protects the, the babies or, or the eggs from、uh, predators like、uh, snakes.、Uh, there's a lot in that area. If a snake go in there and trying to go in the tunnel,、uh, the snake is gonna fall because、uh, it's too hard to go in and, and get the, the babies. But while some birds impress humans with their building skills, others try to impress their mates with their flair for decorating. The bower birds of Australia build bowers or mating arenas, and then use a splash of color to attract females. The males go out and try to collect material that's of a particular color. In the case of satin bower birds, it's blue, so they'll collect blue feathers, blue cigarette packs, blue、uh, clothespins, whatever happens to be blue. It used to be thought that the males just had to scatter these out, but then people did experiments in which they would, while the male was away feeding, actually move one or two of the decorations. A male would arrive back and stare in an obviously disturbed manner at this array, and after a while, find the two redeployed objects and put them back where they belong. People have actually done experiments in which they have made it impossible to move the objects that have been、uh, slipped to the side, and the males have gotten so upset they've torn down the bower and started an entirely new one. Experiments aside, birds and humans are increasingly sharing the same space. As a result, some very unnatural materials are ending up in some very natural places, often to the birds' detriment. Birds are definitely opportunists when it comes to building nests. They'll use natural materials, so anything that they can find, usually plant materials. But they'll definitely also use whatever else is available, including materials that can strangle baby birds or rob the nest of life-giving warmth, such as yarn, metal wire, and in the case of this nest, monofilament fishing line. Like the birds, many creatures possess the innate desire to find shelter and protect their young. But some animal engineers aren't satisfied with simply building a home or even an apartment complex, opting instead to build an entire city. The modern skyscraper is a city unto itself. Builders of high rises must consider every detail of construction before they begin. Engineers take into consideration the occupants' needs, such as mobility within the building, water, air circulation to maintain comfort, and of course a stable, properly constructed framework to keep it all from toppling over. Just like their human counterparts, animals intent on building skyward must design for their own comfort and safety inside their towering cities. Termites have to be the master champions of. Animal builders, at least compared to their size, perhaps a millimeter or two long. Nevertheless, the structures they'll build can be 10 or 20 feet high, the equivalent of a building half a mile high for us. Moreover, they will dig tunnels down to the water table, and 50 feet for a termite is more like a mile and a half. Again,、uh, far deeper than any human well. Remarkably, these massive structures that populate both the African grassland and Australian outback. Are created one mouthful at a time, and may take more than a decade to complete. The insects remove dirt from deep inside the nest and deposit the muddy saliva mixture at the surface. Inside the mound, the termites make use of one of humanity's greatest engineering discoveries: the arch. The reason for building the arches is simply to build a very porous structure, minimize the use of materials,、uh, but use arches because arches are, as the Romans knew,、uh, inherently strong.、And、this is the way they're able to build a structure that's incredibly tall and yet doesn't have a lot of material in it. And its main purpose, after all, is air conditioning. Air conditioning. Incredibly, the mounds are built not only to circulate fresh air, but also keep the nest cool in the hot sun. 
Convection currents in the nest are powered by heat, generated both internally from the million plus termites and externally by the sun, warming the walls of the mound. The warm carbon dioxide laden interior air rises and seeps through the porous exterior walls and upper stacks. Fresh oxygen rich air replaces the escaping gas. It then drops into the nest where it is further cooled by moisture evaporating out of the mud. The termites are ingrained with a strong desire to build, but not all species look skyward. Others construct small nests out of recycled material. This is a colony of Pacific dampwood termites. You can see they're constructing, using fecal pellets, a ring-like structure here, which eventually they will glue to the surface of the container. So the sort of coarse, crumbly-looking material is actually structural material that they've been building. Eventually, they'll f have the whole container filled with a matrix made of fecal pellets. Ants are another social insect that build nests. Like the termites, some have evolved to build with materials that are readily available, even if those materials are other ants. One of the more interesting nest architectures is with uh, African driver ants. In the New World, they're called army ants. Some of these nests can be tremendous, over 20 million ants within a single colony. And they're not in a permanent nest site. They form bivouacs that move from place to place to find new food. Within this mass of living ants that are linked together, they form their chambers and their tunnels. But some of the most sophisticated ant structures can be found under your feet. Many species build huge underground cities, just like a child's ant farm, only hundreds of times larger. Using their jaws and feet, they excavate tunnels, build bridges, and construct intricate cells to store food and house their young brood. We say that our civilization is built on the opposable thumb where we can manipulate materials to build our structures. Well, in the ant society, we might say that um, it's built on the mandible, the opposable jaws, which they use for defense. They use it for moving the brood around. They use it for excavating their nests. The only visible indications of the complex and often deep-reaching nests are their openings which can be as small as the point of a pencil. And these pencil points are exactly what Professor Walter Chinkle of Florida State University is interested in finding. His goal is to understand the ants by understanding the structures they build. And the best tools for his work are a portable kiln and some very hot zinc. Pretty good. Definitely hot. The professor uses 600 degree molten metal to cast the insides of ant colonies. With the metal heating, the professor and his assistant take to the field to find the ant holes. Okay, so these are the first two ant nests we're going to do. You kind of have to prepare the entrance a little because they're a little narrow right now to pour metal into accurately, so we, we're going to open these up a little bit to give us a better target for the metal. We try to find ant nests that are recently abandoned because obviously we don't really like to kill ants. Okay, so that's ready. With multiple ant colonies marked for casting, it's time to pour. The professor quickly carries the smoldering molten zinc to the first hole. Okay, uh, the far one, one first. first. Okay. Bullseye. Once the metal is cooled, the hard part will begin. The professor must now find the bottom of the ant hole. The depth and complexity of these nests can even catch the experts off guard. Well, 
looks like this one's deeper than I expected, so uh, we're gonna have to dig a pit next to it so we can stand in it and uh, get this nest out in one piece. With each shovel full of sand, more of the ant's hidden world is revealed. The basic uh, structure of this ant nest is a vertical tunnel with horizontal chambers coming off of it. And that's a very common um, structure for many species of ant nests. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to hold this nest up here and Kevin's going to loosen it and I'll pull it out. Here we go. Here, I got it. Okay. Okay. All right. Is that going to... Look at that. Hold? I hope it doesn't break. Woo! That is complete, That complete. is a big one. It looks fairly typical. It's got the vertical tunnel and chambers that are connected by the tunnel. They almost always end in a blind chamber like that. Okay, I'm going to carry it to the truck, all right? Back on campus, the professor studies the over 100 casts he has pulled from the ground. What you have here is a nest cast of the Florida harvester ant, Pergana myrmex badius. And you can see it has a very distinct architecture. They're the largest and most complex chambers are near the top, near the surface. And the chambers get smaller and less complex and further apart as you go down in the nest. In the bottom, a third of the nests are the brood and most of the time the queen, that is the young ants, and the youngest adult workers. And as they get older, they gradually move upward in the nest. Only the oldest ones are found near the surface. How ants uh, create this complex architecture is something of a mystery. They do it in the dark, without a blueprint and without a leader. Somehow, each ant knows exactly what needs to be done, how to interact with each other in the nest, and the result is what you see here, this, this rather complex and species-typical architecture. By working together, the ants and the cities they build thrive. But not every bug depends on the colony. Spiders produce and weave some of the finest homes in the animal world and will happily eat any insect unfortunate enough to join them. The bulletproof vest, one of law enforcement's best defensive tools. The secret to its success is an amazing synthetic material known as Kevlar. Many times stronger than steel, the material is light and can be woven together like fabric. Every year, millions of dollars are spent on super fiber research as scientists and engineers look for the seemingly impossible combination of light, strong, and flexible. But many entomologists know that they don't need to look past their backyard because when it comes to making new super materials, eight-limbed arachnids have a definite leg up. While spider silk is almost as strong as high tensile steel, what really sets spider apart from all other biological and man-made materials is its incredible toughness. And toughness is the amount of energy that the material can absorb before failure. Toughness allows webs to stretch and not break, like this one snaring a bat in mid-flight. Not only does it have a high tensile strength, but it's also highly extensible. So dragline silk, for example, can stretch about 25% beyond its original length. In contrast, some man-made fibers, such as high tensile steel or Kevlar, are very stiff, and they can't be stretched very far before they break. Well, this machine is a nano tensile tester that we use to look at the mechanical properties of spider silks. By mounting a sample of a single spider silk thread onto the machine, the machine can then gradually pull that thread and measure the amount of force that's needed to pull the thread until it breaks. This allows us to test how strong the fiber is, how stretchy the fiber is, and how tough it is. Spider silk may eventually lead to products stronger than steel, but far lighter and much more flexible. With all its potential applications, it's sometimes easy to forget that this material emanates from the end of a spider. The animal physically pulls the final fibrous product from small spinnerets at the rear of its abdomen. But the silk production itself starts deep within the creature. If you could look inside a spider's abdomen, you would find anywhere from just a few to perhaps even 
thousands and thousands of tiny individual silk glands. From these silk glands, the silk travels down a narrow duct, and as it travels down the narrow duct, the liquid silk is transformed into a dry fiber. So by the time the silk exits the spider through the spigots on the spinnerets, we have a solid fiber. As impressive as the silk production is, what the spider does with the material is just as amazing. The best known spider constructions are the common circular webs, called orb webs. But their building process is anything but common. Now an orb web is made up of several types of architectural elements. The first thing the spider does is construct the frame, and that's made from one type of silk. Then the next thing the spider does is lay down radii from a center point. So she lays out radii, and that's using the same kind of silk that was used in the frame. After the frame and radii are constructed, the spider prepares the capture spiral. And the capture spiral is a mixture of two types of silk. One is a stretchy fiber, and the other one is a gluey droplet that gets laid down over this stretchy piece of silk. And these gluey droplets allows insects to actually get stuck to the web. Every type of orb weaving spider spins a different web pattern. But the final product is always a lethal trap. The webs are able to snare insects many times bigger than the spider. And on occasion, the unforgiving strands not only capture bats, but also small birds. Despite the silk's incredible toughness and the engineering involved in creating the webs, at the end of the day, the spiders often do something abhorrent to most engineers. They destroy their masterpieces to build them again the following day. The so silk is largely made up of protein. And protein is a very valuable resource to an animal. So a typical orb web weaving spider will actually recycle their silk from day to day. If you ever watch a spider in your yard take a web down, she actually very carefully bundles all the silk up into a little ball and then she'll actually consume that ball and recycle the amino acids from that web into tomorrow's web. The orb weaver webs are some of the best known. They certainly aren't the only ones out there. Some spiders weave silken parachutes that help them take to the wind. Others build cozy subterranean homes. While some of the most infamous web spinners make what appears to be a mess. This is a black widow. The web that black widows make is very tough, and even though it's messy looking and not well engineered, it works perfectly for the kind of close quarters that black widows need their webs to be housed in. You can see how tough this is. I'm actually pulling the sticks inside with the web that she's got still attached. Spiders share a common thread with all animal engineers. These specialized creatures depend for their survival on their mysterious desire to manipulate the world around them. The fascination to me is that the animals create these incredibly complex and yet highly adapted structures without uh, any prior experience. Uh, just the idea that they know to make them and they know how to make them and that each species seems to make a different one uh, is impressive compared to humans who seem to have no clue how to make anything uh, without being trained. Our ability to learn and capacity for abstract thought may separate us from the animals. But no matter how massive our creations grow or how advanced our construction materials become, animals around the world remind us that we aren't the first builders, but simply the latest in a long line of nature's engineers.